welcome back for another episode of the Endless Borough Podcast. You're all very welcome. I am, as always, your host, Keith Russell. For this episode, I am joined by the brilliant Caroline McMenamin, who is a psychotherapist and an integrative counsellor. She's also the founder of Replenish, which is a non-clinical mental health organisation that delivers mental health workshops around the UK and Ireland in schools, workplaces and communities. So we're going to have a chat with Caroline about that as well. Caroline has suffered with an anxiety-based mental health disorder since she was age four, which has inspired her to help other people, which is brilliant. And I want to chat to Caroline about that as well. So Caroline, that's enough of me waffling on. Uh, Thanks very much for coming on the show today. Uh, How are you? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me. It's an honour. You're very welcome. No, it's an honour to have you on. Um, You're very active on Instagram and you're very popular. So I just thought I'd get you on and have a little bit of a chat today. Um, so it was actually your idea, Caroline, to have a chat today about living fully with a mental health illness. And I was only saying to you earlier on that uh, I couldn't believe that I haven't addressed this already on the podcast because it's something that is kind of very close to me or close to my heart. I think people with anxiety can probably relate to that. But we will get to that in a few minutes. But in the meantime, Caroline, maybe would you like to, just in case people aren't too familiar about yourself and your replenish and who you are, do you want to just kind of give people a little oversight into you? Sure. Um, So I'm a dairy girl, hence the accent. (laughs) Um, And I obviously grew up in Derry until I was 30 and then I moved to Dublin then with my fiancé. Growing up was, you know, your standard Irish family life not them fortunately I had a very loving sheltered maybe too sheltered upbringing um but I always remembered from no age that I always had a that impending sense of doom um and then by the the age of eight I moved house which triggered a sort of set of events then that would ultimately lead to me kind of becoming even more aware of having a mental health condition but not being able to verbalize it until I was 21 at which age then I was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder um my OCD is more around pure O which is sort of a term for obsessional thinking and not too many compulsions now that being said I do have some compulsions as I look at the plug here I have a compulsion to pull out plugs um, because my OCD kind of centers around an inflated sense of responsibility now with me and and OCD OCD is a neurobiological condition so it's there from birth so it's kind of the shape of your brain essentially um some people can have it and not have you know really exaggerated effects of it like I have but what often happens is that you start out with anxiety and then if you're more inclined to have like an obsessed an obsessive personality then it can manifest on the OCD and that's what happened with me I always had anxiety did have intrusive thoughts but what really really triggered it was when I was eight years old my little dog got knocked down because we had moved house and she crossed the road and because she wasn't used to the area and she got knocked down I internalized that as my fault hence the inflated sense of responsibility so that now kind of looks like the need to pull out plugs the need to make things sit a certain way because if they don't something bad could happen and I will be responsible other people may pull out plugs and like symmetry and other things to be in a certain way because it feels right that's so that would be me. compulsion yeah it's it's often for different reasons and I kind of feel like I have a passion to kind of really educate people around OCD and that it's not just about contamination whilst it is that's only scratching the surface um ocd is really around interested thoughts and doubt basically um so i got diagnosed when i was 21 um i was put on medication sertraline and i was put on the highest dose received cognitive behavioral therapy which was you know created a huge shift in my thinking and i'm eternally grateful you know, for that modality of therapy, because it would actually lead me then to study the therapy itself and become a CBT therapist. I actually 
prior to that graduated with a degree in drama and did my thesis on drama as therapy because I found the medium of drama really therapeutic especially the process of getting into character because when you get into character and actor training you sort of have to go through these little exercises that neutralizes yourself so mm. your habitual pose your habitual you know stare and physical gestures and it sort of felt like for a while in those two three hours of acting class that I left myself outside the room and was able to embody someone else so I really enjoyed mm. that and I think that's why method actors like mm. Daniel Day-Lewis, my favorite actor, are incredible because they immerse themselves into this character. But I also would imagine it's quite hard because then they have to go back to themselves. Yeah. You know, which I think is why, you know, you have the likes of Heath Ledger, but that's an entirely different conversation. <laughs> so after I trained as a CBT therapist, I wanted to kind of widen my repertoire of like therapeutic approaches. And so I did the standard counseling degree. Um, so then that covers, you know, your psychodynamic therapy, so Freud, more CBT and more humanistic therapy, so Charlie Rogers and things like that. So in, in present day, I would utilize all those kind of approaches, mainly CBT. At that time, in 2016, I developed Replenish and I wanted Replenish to be an active word because you know therapy and recovery is ongoing mm. and you constantly want to replenish yourself and it's based around the sea because I often find the sea and the ocean for a lot of Irish people very very therapeutic and cleansing mm. um, and actually what one time I was in Barcelona and a wave knocked me over and you know I stood up and I saw things sort of differently you know as you do with salt water in your eye and sort of grateful that you were breathing again and I th sort of thought, you know, that's what mental illness is like. It's like these waves crashing in on you. You go underwater, you can't breathe for a while. You're tumbling around and you think you're never going to survive it. But you do. And when you do, you stand up and you see things with a new replenished perspective. And so that's why I the, the logo of replenish is a wave. Um, so it is kind of like embracing the wave for how it makes you see things differently and how it actually conditions you to be the stronger, more resilient person. So Replenish essentially, like you said, is a combination of workshops for community and workplaces, but I take pride on it being very non-clinical because I find that's what really helped me um, in recovery, this non-clinical approach to mental health. Um, and so I kind of like to kind of champion that in my work um with my with my personal clients and with well-being workplace um workshops and in the community as well and um i i with my drama background i'm quite creative and i like to be creative so for the last couple of years i marked world mental health day you know with a documentary in dairy kind of just sort of looking at mental health and how it's sort of presented in dairy and then after that i did like a, a free workshop that had loads of speakers on for men and women and then I had a short movie and then I wrote and directed a play. And then what else did I do? So the last two years then I've just sort of launched new programs on World Mental Health Day. Um, and this World Mental Health Day, October 10th, we have a new program launching around having a healthier relationship with food. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> yeah. Well, the having a healthy relationship with food is where I'm at as well, to be honest. <laughs> I've been quite open about it. Need... Yeah. I Go think on. we could all use having a healthier relationship with food in that seeing it, food is neither good or bad because food is demonized a lot. Yeah. But also we use it as an emotional crutch as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's kind of creating that balance between the two. Yeah, yeah. And you, you, you said about using kind of creative means to educate people with mental health. What would that be exactly? I find that very interesting. I love to do role play. And so I used to be quite active on my YouTube channel and there's quite a lot of interaction with me and myself. Um, <laughs> sort of what I would say to someone, me having a panic attack or what it's okay. like having a CD sort of kind of dramatizing what it's like because some people based on their learning styles will prefer to learn about OCD through a dialogue between two people 
or you know a presentation of how it feels so like there's a short video of me driving in my car and then driving back into my driveway to get out to check the door and to make sure that things like that sort of are safe and things so it is it's kind of using creative ways so comedy humor um drama I love art my brother's an artist and I love his art and you know I always try to get him to come in and talk about art as therapy because it's Mm. a great way to express maybe what you may not be able to verbalize or write down and you know when we're creative as well the ruminative part of our brain switches off so it's a really good therapeutic medium yeah yeah and what exactly is an integrative counselor is that just having a, a mixture of all different types yeah, yeah? You're okay using an integrated approach essentially it's also called eclectic therapy as well. right. so an eclectic right. kind of mix just depending on what the client presents right okay okay i want to ask you just before we move on to what we were talking about earlier on but your ocd do you find that like exhausting like are you constantly yeah yeah so i <laughs> I will always say this, but OCD is the tenth most debilitating disorder in the world, according to the World Health Organization, and okay. you know, rightly so because it it it's kind of like having two people in your head. One is telling you that you know everything around you is dangerous, or you have to be careful, and if you don't do these certain things, then you know bad things will happen. For me, my interest of thoughts, you know they have been and can be quite debilitating. Um, With regards to OCD thoughts, they kind of come in different themes for different people. So you would have um, magical thinking. So it's kind of like people think, you know, it's kind of like superstition on steroids, which, you know, is quite common in Ireland because we are a country built on folklore and superstition. So things like, you know, not walking under a ladder, seeing a magpie, having yeah. a good thought when you look at something you know a lot of superstitious thinking that feels very real and I would get a bit of that or I would have um you also have blasphemy OCD which is you know okay. people feeling guilt and panic and anxiety over having blasphemous thoughts um again yeah. living in a country where you know God is great and you're not allowed to have bad thoughts you know mm. it's just OCD of, of course is going to latch on to that so OCD latches on the things that are precious to us. Um, also, it, it can be around aggression, sexual, sexual inappropriate thoughts, um, contamination thoughts. What else? That's what I can think of for now. Hypochondria, health anxiety. The thing with these kind of thoughts things is that when I say thoughts, I don't mean thoughts. I just I also mean thoughts, images, feelings, urges, impulses. And that's why OCD is so debilitating. It's not just an image in your head. I read somewhere that a a theorist or a therapist described OCD as not a thought disorder, but a feeling disorder because the thoughts feel so real that sometimes you have somatic experiences of it. And that's why it's it's so debilitating. Um, And it is a chronic disorder. So days it can just floor me. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to be mindful of myself and, you know, I don't drink alcohol because, you know, I can't, you yeah. know, and I, I grew up loving rock music and Slash is my idol and I loved whiskey for a while and you sort of, sort of have to sacrifice a lot of things, but, you know, for the well-being I have now, I would do it all over again. Yeah. And how, how were you during COVID, like with the lockdowns and that, did you find it was worse or the same? Do you know, I was fine, thankfully. Mm. Um, I'm mm. quite an introvert, borderline recluse. So I was okay. Um, I did have a few episodes where it was more anxiety and just as a result of prolonged maybe stress and boredom. But, you know, I almost expected that. And when I have bad days, I allow myself to have bad days. And that's one thing I say to my clients. Don't fight it because what you resist persists. So if you go, yeah. I'm going to have a bad day. And I'm going to allow myself to have the bad day, but I'm going to do what I'm going to, that I was planning to do anyway. It lets you realize that you can have the bad day, but still go about your day. So then the next yeah. time you have a bad day, you know, you can cope because you've done it before. 
That's exactly it. I was, I'm so glad you said that because that's something that I used to do all the time was I would try and fight a bad day and then you would feel even worse because you're having a bad day and you can't get rid of it. And that's been massive for me is to just embrace it now and say, you know, oh, well, I'm having a bad day. I'm just going to go to it. has been massive for me. I'm so glad you said that. But I have found from talking to people that, and it's probably a common a common. Um, knowledge anyway but uh, people with anxiety a lot of times they have OCD anyway or it comes with it is would you find that spectrum yeah yeah because sorry this place is full of flies um the yeah so because OCD is an anxiety-based disorder it's fear induced and Mm. you know when we feel like we can do something about that fear we will do it and sometimes it becomes obsessive and repetitive. So that's why some people then develop OCD. Not all people with anxiety have OCD, um, but it is quite common. Um, they're sort of two sides of the same coin because what makes the thoughts so scary is the fear attached to them. So that's why exposure therapy and CBT is ideal because exposure therapy is exposing yourself to the fear so much so that you become desensitized to it and therefore it no longer scares you okay right yeah right okay because i i definitely have i definitely have lcd i mean i do it'd be more of the aesthetic part you were talking about where everything has to be lined up and everything has to be neat and tidy i'm constantly cleaning i'm constantly tidying but also it gets worse when i go or i have to leave I have to go out somewhere and you start cleaning and tidying because, well, I don't know why you, you'll obviously know more than me, but for me personally, you know, like we have to go out somewhere and the wife does be always, you know, was she used to when she didn't understand, you know, be like, Oh, we're trying to get the kids ready and you're going around cleaning and tidying. Well, at least now, like we kind of know why I'm doing it, but yeah, that's definitely me. Yeah. Why? It can hold on yeah, to but, like your control or that feeling of just right. Um, because that sort of feeling of doing things until they feel right is Mm. what drives a lot of people to you know make things symmetrical and right and perfect but it also could be I need to make sure everything is plugged out because if there's an electrical fire my house is going to burn down and it's going to be my fault which is my reason and for checking things for leaving you know there's people with OCD and they take the iron or the straighteners with them to work because they literally find it hard to leave okay right yeah yeah no i don't i i, I don't do that <laughs> that's good that's good so you, you you're managing it yeah, but I, yeah one wee tip i will say is that back home in Derry, in my room i have pictures on the wall and there's one picture i intentionally leave crooked and by me doing that it's exposing me to see that nothing bad is going to happen if this picture is crooked and if I sit with the discomfort long enough, it will stop annoying me. So exposing yourself to have to the discomfort of having things crooked will actually make you more desensitized to things that are crooked. Yeah, okay, okay. Because if I feel like if I leave things messy and not tidy and not in their place, I get I get in a bad mood. Like I put I get yeah. really agitated then, you know, yeah. it's just anyway. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> That's enough of us. Um, so, yeah, so as we were um, mentioning at the beginning, living a, a fulfilled life with a mental uh, illness or a mental condition. Um, so this was your idea, Caroline. I'm going to put the kettle on. Off you go. <laughs> um, I think it's important. I, I kind of like to show that, you know, you can live a fully functioning life despite having the 10th most debilitating disorder in the world and I like to sort of model that because I think when people first get diagnosed they almost see it as a death sentence they almost see it as you know character defining and you know I did feel like that too at the very beginning but for me it was more about a sense of liberty that I had because for so long I thought I was weird I was Mm. you know evil or bad or that when I got assessed the assessors when they press a big red button and get me arrested and things like that but you know the the freedom and the the kind of validation that I got from having a diagnosis outweighed any shame yeah and any lifestyle changes I had to make and I think you know when I tell people that the idea of that is scary for them but once they see you know oh well there you're someone who 
is got OCD and quite a bad dose of it is all medication and I'm still on medication um but lives a, a highly functional life then maybe I could do that and, and and I like to kind of show that and but I also show the reality of like you know I can't drink alcohol I have to be careful about sugar intake I will have my bad days hormones set me off stress set me off yeah. maybe you know my work ethic and my ambition up he- are up here but my ability to get there is kind of hampered by my OCD because stress is a big trigger of it. Yeah. Um, and it has been self-aware. And I think what it comes down to is, you know, living a fully functioning life with a mental health disorder comes down to self-acceptance yeah. and self-awareness. With self-acceptance, it isn't all like I'm great and I'm good. It's for me saying I have OCD. Some days it's debilitating, it can take over. And it has in the past to the point where it has left me gravely ill. Um, but it's also saying, you know, I, I'm trying my best. I'm doing my best for myself. You know, I'm vegan and I do it for the animals and I do it for my health and I run and I exercise. I do the best I can. So I'm not, you know, I'm the best I can be. But also self-acceptance comes from knowing that you're not perfect and being okay with that. Knowing that, you know, for me, I always say I have um, a temper, which I do. I blame redheaded Viking blood. That's my excuse. I have DNA to prove it (laughs) from 5% (laughs) Scandinavian. I'm like, I knew it. I knew it. It's that. That's why I have a bad temper. It's the Viking blood on me. (laughs) I did like that ancestry test. So I was like, thank God. Oh, did you? Right. Okay. I was like, thank God I have an excuse now. But um, so it's kind of going, you know what? This is who I am. It's not perfect. You know, I have a temper, but I'm very compassionate. And maybe my temper is, you know, my pain of seeing things bad in the world, you know, because I'm a highly sensitive person. I'm very reactive to the world. I get agitated easily. I don't like loud noises or bright lights. And, you know, I'm, I'm easily affected and that can come out as irritability. So maybe it's not that I'm angry all the time. It's I'm highly sensitive. So I'm owning that I'm a highly sensitive person and I'm okay with that. And, you know, I, I'm owning that I have a disorder that, you know, means I can't drink alcohol and it means I have to introvert and it means I need time away and it means I have to take medication and I'm okay with that. And that means for me, that's, that's what self-acceptance says. It's acceptance of the good and the dark side as Carl yeah. called it, the shadow self. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. Cause I'm so similar. I, just about everything you've said, I'm exactly the same, yeah. all the same, just about all the same. I'm not, Scan- I'm not Scandinavian, but I'm, the rest of it is similar. <laughs> I think, you know, when you have anxiety, it can manifest and not just panic. It can manifest mm. in irritability. Yeah, yes. So, and that's before I was diagnosed. I, I used to be so self-critical of myself, of that. It was, and some people used to say, you're, you know, you're always in bad, you're, you're always in bad form or you're always in bad. And then, and I didn't even know why. And, you know, but as you said, now that you can put a label on it, we can understand it. I'm, I've been able to accept it so much more and then people around me can accept it as well because you can explain it to them then as well you know yeah yeah and that no matter what you like you're no less lovable you know and mm. I think there's something special with people with like conditions like you know mine and yours is that we don't have time for bs because we're too tired dealing with our own stuff that we can present nothing but our real authentic self and i think that is so admirable and i think that's something that sets us apart as a benefit to our personalities because i see online and you see people and people are loved and idolized. And you know it's because they put on a performance. Whereas maybe someone like you and I, maybe we're not the most popular, but I would say that maybe it's because we're our most authentic self. And maybe some people aren't re- ready for that raw, real truth that we as people bring. And that's, yep. you know, what I like about that. And that's maybe, you know, Sometimes we could look at people on social media and go, I'm not as popular as them or I'm not as fun as them, but maybe they have more mental energy, mental energy to sell themselves to a crowd. Whereas 
someone like me, I always say, you know, you either like me or you loathe me, but at least, you know, you're getting that true self and I will never be anything less than my true self. And that may mean, you know, me showing maybe the rough side of me, the, you know, the angry side of me, the, and that may deter people very quickly. Yeah. But I respect people too much to be anything other than, you know, who I am, the good side and the bad side. And I think with yourself as well, that sense of reality and realness and authenticity, what I've noticed is our authenticity as a result of our struggles actually can intimidate people who are not at a place where they're ready to accept what's going on in their lives. Okay. So yeah. authenticity can be quite intimidating for people who are not ready to be authentic with themselves. That's interesting you say that. Yeah, that's actually quite interesting. I never really thought about it like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's true, actually. I'm kind of lost for words now. I never really thought about it like that. Yeah. I mean, I suppose what, like, you know, and even when we say about living a fulfilled life, I suppose that can mean different things for different people. But even as we were saying earlier on, just accepting you're having a bad day. I mean, mm. that, that can be part of it, too, because, like we were saying, like, it can be absolutely physically and mentally draining and exhausting you know well especially for me when i used when i used to try and fight it now that i just embrace it okay my energy levels aren't as high but at least i'm kind of i'm utilizing the, the little bit of energy i have rather than using it on trying to fight something that's just pointless yeah and you know? it could be something like you know for females like hormones cause a lot of baller and you know if for me like if I'm having a bad day I will say to my fiance and just hearing myself say that and voicing it is validating for me and then I will go no caffeine for me today because obviously it stimulates you so therefore you don't need any more stimulation when you're already anxious and it may mean you know mm. stopping work for the day it may mean taking yourself out of walk it may mean doing yoga it may mean putting on your pajamas and watching Disney movies because I love horror and crime. I have a really morbid curiosity and grotesque to the point where it's alarming. And I think my OCD and intrusive thoughts have desensitized me to that kind of thing. So I'm never surprised when I watch it on TV. And that's how you know I'm well because I'm watching all that mad gory stuff. But you know when I'm unwell is I'm sitting watching Sleeping Beauty. Okay, right. Yeah yeah and yeah days I have to do that and I'm okay I'm okay with that like I think maybe yeah. it was last month was the most recent I had to do that and yeah. I go bad day that's okay I allow myself to have the bad day and but I also you know I think maybe one of the biggest examples that I can give and I think I've told this story so many times I'm like a broken record and it's not because I feel conceited about it it's because I'm very proud of it and it surprised me and what that story is that in 20 late 2014 there was a marathon a half marathon in Derry and I signed up for it um but during that time I started to reduce in my meds and I came off it a bit too quickly um and so I had a week of severe severe chronic anxiety you know the kind where you're literally shivering throwing up you can't eat and you think it's the end of the world on that Sunday, I woke up, I was listening to the CAM app, trembling with nerves, belching with sick, you know, that anxiety. Um, and it was the day of the half marathon. And I was like, how oh, am I meant to run 14 miles with nothing in my stomach and no energy? And my parents were like, Johnny, don't do it. Don't do it. It's fine. And I was like, okay. And then my brother living in Australia messaged me. He, he would know what it's like said do you know what F it just do it and that's all I needed and that day then I did my 14 miles in no great pace or time but what I learned that day was I can feel like I'm a shadow of myself when I'm having a bad day I can feel that kind of weighted blanket of anxiety around my neck and I can feel like I'm capable of nothing Despite that feeling, I still have a choice. And I proved that to myself that day I did that half marathon, despite how chronically unwell I was with anxiety that day. Mm. And I did that. And that made me see that, you know, I can feel awful, but I will always have a choice. 
and I chose the hardest choice, but it was the biggest learning for me to date when it comes to having anxiety because you know yourself how debilitating it is, paralyzing, in fact, and you think I'm not capable of anything. But on that day, I proved that wrong. So now I have learned that I can feel that feeling, but it's a lie because I have proof that it's a lie and I can do anything. So I love that quote, get up, dress up, show up and never give up. And it's such a cliche, but oh my God, I live by it because that's the thing that actually has proven to me time and time again, that I always have a choice and I'm stronger than the worst feeling in the world. Yeah, that's incredible. Well done. That's an amazing story. Fair play to you. <laughs> Jesus Christ. 14 miles. <laughs> even, do, even doing that when you're feeling well is would be yeah. tough, you know? And the next day I still felt anxious, but I felt so proud that I was able mm. to do that in the, you know, in the depths of a really bad day. And, you yeah. know, and I tell that story a lot and people may be hearing this podcast and heard that story again and thought, here she goes again. But I use it as an example to show people that they always have a choice so that they, even on their worst days, they can choose to get up. And there were days where I would be crying through putting on my eyeliner because I knew getting up and out was the better thing to do than lying under it. And don't get me wrong, there's days where you have to rest. Yeah. But if it's going on a wee bit too long, then fight against it. You will be so proud. No doubt yeah. you have you know, your fair share, of, fair share of days where you got up oh. and you overcame it. I've so many stories of that. I mean, I lost out on my, te- my teens and my, my 20s because of anxiety, because, you know, and I don't mean as in I didn't, well, I didn't really f- live them properly if you know what I mean mm-hmm. I don't even like th- thinking of those times I was only the podcast I did I did um, yesterday with someone we were talking about this and I don't like listening to uh, 90s music because it reminds me of my teens mm-hmm. it's the same with the noughties whatever it is um, I like listening to 80s music because it reminds me of a better time when I was happier in myself um, do you know it's just we're just talking about, you know, what you were saying about, you know, getting up and, and getting out. I mean, I, I think what year was it? it was 2016 I, I started a new job and I just had a complete breakdown in it. Yeah. I was in floods of tears in the morning. I had to get on a train. I was trying not to cry in the train. I would couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. Jobs wasn't right for me. I was crying myself to sleep at night. I couldn't eat. You know, and I hadn't gone on. I at, the, at this stage, I wasn't on any medication. I hadn't really properly dealt with my anxiety, although I'd suffered from it for so long. I always kind of had therapy for depression and stuff like that. And I was more, I just thought I had depression. And then, but anyway, so, but I kept going in every day to that job. Now I left it eventually because I, I couldn't do it any longer. I, I did it. For as long as I could, but I got up every day. As you said, got up, got dressed, and washed. And I going out, got on the train, got myself in there. And even if I wasn't able to do it a full day, I got myself in there, and I at least tried. Yeah. Because if I hadn't at least tried, I probably would have felt worse after. It, mm-hmm. In my own head, thinking you just gave up, because so many people were saying, "Look, just leave the job," and I'm like, "It's not about the job." Because it wasn't really about the job. It was more about stuff that I hadn't dealt with, that I wasn't, I, you, you know. I, that with yourself as opposed to the yeah, job. Exactly, yeah. yeah, because I had it. I had another job before that, that the same thing happened in. And it, it was becoming a pattern because what happened was I changed careers uh-huh. in 2000. And, well, we I changed careers in 2009, but from 2009 to 2014 or something, I did F all because of my anxiety. I was afraid to, you know, to go out in the world. I was afraid to do, I did bits here and there, but I hadn't really properly, you know, my, I was frozen with anxiety. I was frozen with fear. I lost those few years of just being afraid to go out into the world because I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't felt it didn't how I was going from construction to, I wanted to do digital marketing. I wanted to do graphic design. I wanted to do all of this. And I'm like, how do you go from construction to that? Yeah. With no qualifications, with no experience. I was in my 30s at the time. I had 
um, what year was Aaron born? I think I'd had one, Aaron was born in 2012, so I was just, just had a little boy or you know, around that time, mm-hmm. and I'm like, you know, and it just becomes so overwhelming, all of that stuff. You know, I just had a complete breakdown, but I went in every day, and eventually. I was able to manage the anxiety as in I was able to deal with all of that because I, if I hadn't have forced myself to go in every day and at least try and then realize that it wasn't the job because it, this was now after happening in two different jobs because I had gone to college in the meantime, got myself some qualifications to be able to get those jobs. Uh-huh. Do you know what I mean? But like, that's all I say to somebody if they're feeling like that is like, just try because yeah. for me if I hadn't have tried I probably would have felt worse and if I hadn't have done those jobs I wouldn't have had the experience to go on to the next job yeah. because so I was able you were, mm-hmm. you were conditioning yourself to mm. tolerate and build resilience although and albeit at the time very hard and you know with that it could have been made easier for you you know at that time with therapy maybe with meds you know but mm. you did it in its rawest form, but that has conditioned you to be, you know, a stronger version yeah. of yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's something, you know, is very hard earned. And, you know, without going too much into it, but you're, you're that era of your life where you say you don't really like to think about it and you feel maybe you lost out in it and maybe feel like you, you grieve that at the same time too it wasn't for nothing because that was a time where you know you got to know yourself in ways that many people will never get to know themselves yeah. and yeah. and and in a way it was a different kind of you know era for you because for so long myself I used to think you know I was cursed with this condition whereas it has actually conditioned me to be the strongest most resilient version that I of me that I could possibly be had I not ever had a diagnosis of mental health mm. uh, OCD maybe I wouldn't be who I am maybe I wouldn't like who I would be and so you know I think despite the sacrifices we gave would we change anything maybe we would do things differently but would we give up who we are now just you know even though we struggled a lot I personally wouldn't because I'm quite proud of how far I've come even though I it did mean me missing out on a lot of things because I too was afraid mm-hmm. um yeah but I also noticed that there's a point in your life and I don't know if you've ever noticed it but you compare how brave everybody is to how afraid you are well yeah. someday then you you after a struggle you see then actually I'm miles ahead of these people when it comes to self-awareness and you know yeah. introspection and knowing who I am yeah. because I've had to do that I've had to do the work and I had no other option because it was survival and in doing that you become a more whole completed person and you start to see that you're stronger and more resilient than the average person around you because of mm-hmm. the struggle you endured so yeah. for me when you felt that maybe you were missing out you were doing the work on yourself and those people who maybe didn't miss out mm. still haven't done that work on themselves yeah. and they're less of a whole person than you are yeah because you've oh, done yeah. that work because you've had to it's amazing when it's you, amazing say, you it say it now um is that me or you i'm hearing an echo that's me oh. it's amazing when you say that now because at the time you don't feel like it you know you feel like but my my brother-in-law only recently said that to me. He says, you're probably the bravest person that I know. And this is coming from him who he's, you know, he's a great job and very successful. And I work for him now. And we were like, it was, it was taught, like we were in the office at the time. And he was like, you're probably the bravest person in here. Because I was having a bad day at the time. And, you know, just having a bit of a wobble. But when people say that to you, like, it's hard to, I, it's hard to believe it yourself yeah. but when you kind of put it into perspective and you the way you just put it you can you should we should be very proud of ourselves although it's very hard to I think even being Irish as well you, it's it's nearly in us to not want to yeah. give ourselves praise for stuff yeah. but how far we've come like you, you just yourself and me in particular because because we're talking to each other here like 
when you look back at it, Jesus, what we've gone through and where we are today. Like, if, for example, if I hadn't pushed myself to, to, to keep, keep going in that job, say I just gave up straight away. God knows if I had have got the next job that would have led me to the world to this job and I wouldn't have been able to learn all those things about myself because I wouldn't have went for therapy. I wouldn't have, I, I wouldn't have been so self-aware about stuff. I probably wouldn't have started this podcast because I wouldn't have known so much about myself and so many people probably wouldn't have told me you have a great story you should try and share. I know all these type of things. So like you, you, you think there's use of the world is coming to an end at the time, but it's all for a reason, I suppose. Whether you believe in that type or stuff or not, I might, I probably probably don't as much as other people. But in another way, you know, all these things that you do have a reason or they have a purpose, even if you don't feel it at the time. Do you know what I mean? I'm probably not making any sense, but no, what? it is because I I kind of feel like you know, for me, like had I not had a mental illness I don't know what I would do because I had not I had no real interest in any real career maybe mm. archaeology but I don't like me too place. me too archaeology yeah well yeah archaeology spirits were caught yeah. in the same place. I always want to be an archaeologist we, we did some self-digging um <laughs> but you know my illness ignited a passion and gave me a career you know mm. and I would hate to do something that doesn't leave me fulfilled. That is a terror, that's a big fear. Whereas what I do now fulfills me and no doubt what you do here speaking fulfills you. But also when you were talking, I just thought how lucky are your children to have a parent, especially a male, you know, father who is able to chat to them in a way that maybe would have saved maybe someone you're you know you when you were their age me when I was their age you know that is something that could change their lives all because you did that work and I think that's what our children need more than ever because there's parents out there and they're not aware at all and you know and it's no fault of my parents that didn't know about mental health illnesses or were able to go oh our Caroline is exhibiting Mm -hmm. traits of OCD we need to go and get her checked we'll get early intervention and she'll be a highly functioning adult by the time she's 21 that didn't happen but for your child and because of your struggle yeah your child will be saved a lot of bother because of you well it's funny you say that because my my daughter who's seven suffers from anxiety yeah and even this morning going into school she was getting upset um she suffers from anxiety quite badly Mm. But I'm able to be so, yes. what's the word I'm looking for? You know, I can be kind of, yes, yes, exactly. That's the word I'm looking for. Exactly. That's the word I'm looking for. But I, and I can understand and I can kind of, so I'll talk to her in a different way where maybe others wouldn't because I can completely understand where she's coming from. And then my, other, my son, who's nine, he's starting to show traits of body dysmorphia that I had. So we're because I'm so kind of aware of that at the moment as well. I'm able to we're, we're not deal with it, but we're able to pick up on that as well. Little small things about him pulling at his clothes or, you know, the, the, the pool out the back with his T-shirt on or small things he says, like where I'm able to pick up on all of that as well. Hopefully nip that in the butt or maybe that's not the wrong phrase, but you know what I mean? To try and at least d- deal with it fairly <laughs> How lucky are they to have you who is able to because when I was seven I was crying going out the door the wind blowing and my snots flying in the air because I was crying I had no reason I was just anxious I didn't get any help until I was 21 yeah but your daughter at seven is already yeah. getting help because she has a dad who's aware and that's the good yeah. thing with the times but it's also really good yeah. because her daddy took that time to do the work and now she's lucky to have a parent who gets it there yeah. is nothing better than that because see when I'm talking to a client with OCD it's not me as a therapist that helps her first it's me with OCD who gets it and that makes all the difference and I think yeah. it's so your children are so lucky to have that 
more than you probably realize and more than they realize because that will make the difference between them having to wait until they're 21 to get a diagnosis and getting help at that age. Yeah, 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 very true. Thanks very much. Maybe on that note, we leave it there because my dog is starting to, my, my actual dog is starting to bark in the background. So before he loses the head, we probably better wrap this up. Is there anything, I, Carolyn, is there anything that you want to add before we go? I, honestly, God, before you, sorry for interrupting you. I can actually sit here and do this all day with you because that was, fat. like, honest to God, I think we've probably only touched the surface with this and maybe you might come on and we'll do a, a part two of this. Um, because that was really fascinating but yeah have you anything that you want to add before we go no i'm just really grateful for having such a stimulating conversation and it's such a comfort to meet like like-minded people you know and we kind of unite in our struggle but we are actually you know see parts of ourselves and each other and kind of like you know admire each other and more so too i think it's so refreshing to see a male kind of advocate of mental health because god knows it's needed you know what I mean? Because if I ever have sons, you know, there's only so much as I, a female, can do yeah. to relate to them. So it really makes me feel really warm inside to see more and more men speaking out. And I really just want to thank you for doing that for all the men. Thank you so much. Yeah, that, I, re I really appreciate that. I, to be honest, um, I think I've gone through so much and I've suffered, lived with it for so long. I just kind of felt listen, if I can't help someone, I don't know who can. Yeah. So I've got like, I've just, I just wanted to share my story. It's, that's all I wanted to do because I, like I said, I've suffered for so long. You're just beyond that point of insecurity. Your yeah. passion to see your insecurity. And I yeah. think that's the one thing that drives us a lot that yeah. we don't care what people think. We don't care of the stigma. Our passion is you know, overarching everything and you know yeah. and thank god for your passion because no doubt you're saving so many lives and helping so many men so yeah. i think that's one thing we should constantly give ourselves credit for exactly and that's exactly what the point i was just about to make is the reason why i was saying all of that is because sometimes we need to thank ourselves and praise ourselves and not feel basically like an Irish person and be afraid of what people are going to say about us because I got so many messages and lovely comments from people and I nearly feel embarrassed about it. I feel when someone gives me praise, I get embarrassed about it. I, when I'm doing stuff, I'm a, nearly, I'm feeling anxious about sharing a link to something I've done because I'm kind of like, oh, would you look at him? He's doing something else. And this is absolutely nonsense. And it's ridiculous. And it's, it's just something that we need to just stop really. And as you said, take a step back and be proud of ourselves. This dog is barking in the background. So we're probably going well, to have to go. in the corner clapping for you. Thanks, I really work. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Uh, Caroline, do you want to let, let people know where they can get in touch with you? Um, I'm on uh, Instagram. I was read on the score Duchess. And Duchess is spelled with a T for search engine and optimization because it's more commonly spelt than the original way that people know. <laughs> and then on that, you can get the link to my replenish page, which is where I just provide a lot of education essentially on different mental health topics. So again, thanks so much for having me, Keith. It's been a huge honor. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks for coming on. Honestly, God, I could sit here and like I said, we're still having gone because we're still talking. And honestly, I could sit here all day and do this. And the only reason I'm going is because <laughs> my house is starting. for me. What's that? Give him a little boop for me. I will, I actually. Dogs. I, I will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, listen, we have to go. We have to go. We have to go. All right. Right. Uh, <laughs> bye. Guys, bye. Listen, guys, we'll be back very shortly with another episode. And uh, thanks again for joining us today. Uh, I'll see you all again very soon. Bye.